I just want to say before Roger goes, he, um, he said how much he was inspired as a graduate student to uh, learn about general relativity from Herman Bondi. Um, I was a graduate student here in Oxford in the 70s and was equally inspired by Roger's lectures on uh, relativity theory. And uh, he's remained an inspiration all my life. And a lot of what I'm going to talk about ultimately draws from uh, ideas of his own. Um, we had actually a, a, a question about the role of quantum computing and consciousness. And I'm going to sort of make a, a link here. And, and strangely enough, it'll be through the David Deutsch paper that Roger mentioned, that Roger communicated to the Royal Society. Um, but I'm going to start with a, an enigma, which is um, going to bring together um, a picture in Roger's book, The Emperor's New Mind, with the front cover of uh, Leonor Blum's book on computation, uh, complexity in real computation, and the human brain. So the question is, what, what is the connection between these three things? I should explain that the figure from Emperor's New Mind is a sketch of the phase space of what Roger calls the Hawking box. And the Hawking box is not other, none other than um, an isolated lump of matter that just sort of does nothing. It, well, it doesn't do nothing, but it's isolated. And it goes through various phases of collapsing into a black hole, re-radiating particles, the particles then collapsing under the collapse of the wave function, and so on. And, uh, well, I'll talk a bit more about it as we get through the talk. But three nominally completely different ideas. What, what's the connection? Um, so, Leonor's book, I think, was very much motivated by a conjecture of Rogers in Emperor's New Mind that the Mandelbrot set, the fractal Mandelbrot set, may be uh, undecidable, non-computable in some sense. And um, essentially, one of the key theorems in the book is to show that that is the case. And in particular, through theorem one, which we won't go through, um, the so-called halting sets um, of systems must have integral Hausdorff dimension. So if you have a set which doesn't have integral Hausdorff dimension, um, in some sense it isn't a, a halting set of the system. And this was made a little bit more, uh, if you like, tangible by a paper by Simon Dubé. Uh, and the last se sentence of the abstract is, uh, is worth just repeating or reading out. He says, one can build a fractal-based geometric model of computation, were, which is computationally uh, universal. So basically, you can describe all the theory, the Turing theory of, of computing machines and so on, with fractal geometry. And the undecidable propositions in computing theory can be recast as geometric problems to do with fractals, for example, whether a line intersects a fractal or not. So the key undecidable properties of computing theory are, have links to the geometry of fractals. And I've shown on the right the fractal geometry of the famous Lorentz 63 system. The, the system itself is defined by differential equations. The geometry is something which is a kind of emergent at t equals infinity. It's a kind of a long-term future asymptotic property, emergent geometric property um, of those equations. And based on the bloom uh, Dubé theory, basically, you know, we're looking at a, a, a computational approximation, if you like, of something which is fundamentally uh, a, an uncomputable geometry. And the properties of that geometry are typically undecidable. Um, so, well, we've already had Roger talking about this, but uh, I, I, um, a book, a very small book he wrote in 1997 is a, is a kind of summary of a lot of his key ideas. And I've just drawn three quotes from that book, um, which more or less um, are consistent with what he's just said. The first is that um, there's some reason to believe that the true quantum gravity theory uh, might be non-computable. Um, uh, the second is, he says, I'm very much a proponent of viewpoint C, which is that appropriate physical action of the brain evokes awareness. 
but this physical action cannot even be simulated properly uh, computationally. Um, and the third quote from that book I, I, I'm going to uh, come back to is about non-locality. I think there was a question actually about Bell's theorem, but my own view, Roger says, is that to understand uh, quantum non-locality, I put so-called quantum non-locality um, because I don't actually think we need to use that word non-locality, um, but will require a radically new theory. The new theory will not just be a slight modification of quantum mechanics, but something as different from standard quantum mechanics as general relativity is from Newtonian gravity. It would have to be something which has a completely different uh, conceptual framework. All right, so just let's go back to that Hawking box. Um, so what, is, what Roger is describing here is, as I say, the phase space of an isolated lump of matter going through uh, evolution. And he's divided the phase space into two portions, A and B. Uh, B which contains black holes and A which doesn't contain black holes. And makes the point that in these two regions of phase space, the trajectories, the phase space trajectories, are undergoing qualitatively different types of behavior. On the right, where the black holes um, are forming and evaporating, the trajectories are converging. This is signifying, for Roger, a, a loss of information, black hole information loss. On the left-hand side, we're seeing the effects of, if you like, quantum decoherence and the collapse of the wave function. And that's manifest in terms of the divergence of trajectories. So we have these two regions with differing phase space properties. We're clearly dealing with a nonlinear system. Obviously, black hole dynamics is nonlinear, but also we believe the collapse of the wave function must involve some kind of nonlinear dynamics. So we're dealing with a nonlinear system whose phase space has this structure. So the, the link to the non-computable fractal geometry is to ask the question, what actually is the asymptotic phase space geometry of this isolated system? Because we have all the ingredients of uh, chaotic fractal-based dynamics, like the Lorentz equation, to produce a, uh, a non-computable, fractionally dimensioned, uh, asymptotic invariant set. So if that was the case, we would have actually a physical, if you like, manifestation of the non-computability that both Leonore and Roger have spoken about in their books in, in different ways. Now this has been a, a long kind of, um, uh, kind of fascination of mine, having done a PhD in general relativity and sort of appreciated the importance of geometric laws to think that maybe uh, we could maybe understand quantum physics in terms of geometric uh, laws, but now not ge geometry of space-time, but the geometry of state space or, or phase space, as some people call it. I personally prefer the term state space to phase space. Phase space is, uh, tends to be very much a Hamiltonian type of description, but I think state space is a bit more general. Um, so in, in 19... Uh, no, 2009, not 19, 2009 or so, I wrote a paper in the Royal Society about the, the sort of hypothesis that the universe might be a deterministic system evolving on precisely on one of these fractal invariant sets, like the long-term asymptotic behavior of the, of the Hawking box. And actually, a, a, a question which I've asked Roger a number of times, but I'm not sure we know the answer is, if we took his conformal cyclic cosmology, what would be the asymptotic phase portrait of that, would it be actually a fractal as well? I suspect the conditions are right for it to be. Now this interests me because, and we'll come on to, since we had a talk this morning a little bit about this, um, the, my motivation for this was very much that um, this actually provides a way of explaining the violation of Bell's inequality without needing to invoke either uh, indeterminism or non-locality, and I'll explain why very shortly. Um, there's some interesting links to, I think, quite deep mathematics here because fractal Cantor sets um, are known to be homeomorphic to the sets of p-adic integers and p-adic numbers are, you know, uh, I mean, Roger mentioned Andrew Wiles's Fermat's Last Theorem, p-adic numbers are absolutely central to modern day number theory. Um, and indeed, the, the Fields medalist Peter Scholzer has sort of started a whole new branch of mathematics called piadic geometry, uh, 
um, which may well be the type of mathematics that we'll need if we're to describe these types of fra uncomputable fractal invariant sets in a mathematically precise way. Picture on the right is a, is a kind of geometric example of a Cantor set with three iterated pieces, which if you can imagine just keep going on and on. And these are formally homeomorphic to the three, so-called three-adic uh, integers. Okay, so I wanted to, um, again, I wasn't expecting this, but Roger mentioned uh, David Deutsch's uh, very seminal paper, which appeared in the mid-80s. I should say David was actually a contemporary of mine uh, in, under the, cosm we were both students of the cosmologist uh, Dennis Sharma, who um, was a great friend of Roger's and in fact, I think was the, one of the key inspirations for Roger changing from pure mathematics into physics, mathematical physics. Um, but anyway, David wrote this very seminal paper in the 1980s about quantum computing. And again, it's worth just reading a little bit um, from the abstract because he talks about, uh, you know, before we built quantum computers, 1985 this was, commu well, communication 1984, commu computing machines resembling universal quantum computer uh, could be built and would have many remarkable properties not reproducible by any Turing machine. Um, he then says these do not include the computation of non-recursive functions, but they do include quantum parallelism, um, a method by which certain probabilistic tasks can be performed faster by a universal quantum computer than by any classical restriction of it. Um, and we had a... a, a a question about that and um, so David Deutsch's view is that the exponential speed up, this exponential speed up is not just sort of a, you know like an instance of Moore's law of sort of chips getting a little bit faster with time. This is something quite fundamental um, that quantum computers can do that classical computers can't do and can only be explained by this notion of quantum parallelism. Now he says at the end of this quote that uh, the explanation of these properties, in particular quantum parallelism, places an intolerable strain on all interpretations of quantum theory other than Everett's. Uh, so Everett being the many worlds uh, theory. Now, this is 1985, and I guess what David said may, may well be right in 85. Um, my own view is that he is touching on something uh, extremely important here, this notion of quantum parallelism. My, my own personal belief is, because uh, I'm not a fan of many worlds for, for a number of reasons, which I won't go into, but the notion that, um, that I tried to uh, draw out in this paper in 2009 about this invariant set does give a, a, another uh, explanation for this parallelism, which is it's, it's the geometry of this set in, in state space the fact that we're not just, uh, that the equations of motion are not just, if you like, Euler-Lagrange equations along a single trajectory, a single curve, a single one-dimensional curve, but we're looking at some geometry in the full dimension of the state space of the system. Um, I think that itself provides uh, an explanation of this parallelism that Deutsch himself felt was so important to uh, understand the power that quantum computers have over classical computers. So I want to kind of bring that idea into a bit more explicit uh, form with uh, this discussion about consciousness and so on. Um, and let's suppose that, that Roger and, and Stuart Hammeroff are correct, that, that cognition is an inherently quantum process. I'm going to take that as a given. I have to say in parenthesis that my own feeling is that Maybe some support for this idea could come from the fact that, you know, people that study quantum and classical processes, often quantum processes take much less energy to do the same task than classical processes. So this could be just an evolutionary trait towards energy efficiency uh, in the brain. I don't know. But in any case, this invariant set postulate gives us a very, um, if you like, specific realization or instance of this notion that cognition in the brain is inherently non-computable. 
But I want to go more than that, and I want to talk about uh, sort of, th I'm going to focus on three things uh, that we've spoken about in the meeting so far. Um, so obviously, in all of these discussions, we have to say what we mean by consciousness. Um, my own feeling is that uh, rather than talk about consciousness in a, in a broad sense, I, I like to think about, for example, right at this very moment, I'm conscious of the fact there's a clock on the wall. Okay, I, I can't remember what time I started. If I knew what time I started, I'd be panicking now because I'd taken too long. Um, but nevertheless, I am conscious of the fact there's a clock on the wall. So what does it mean to talk about being conscious of, of there being a clock on the wall? And in some sense, my own, my own view is that that word denotes a concept that I'm aware of an object which has some existence, which is in some sense independent of everything else in the room. You know, you guys can all go out for your tea later, the clock will still be there. Uh, and maybe at some stage somebody will take the clock off the wall and set the time if it's running fast or slow. So there's some notion of, um, of the clock being somewhat independent of the rest of the world. If you ask me a really difficult question at the end, and I'm kind of focusing my head on trying to answer it, I'll then probably lose any sense of anything in this room having an independent existence. I, I'll just be kind of vaguely aware of the room while well, my thoughts whiz around, and I'll lose this sense of individual things having an independent existence. And in some sense, then I would say I'm, I'm, I wasn't conscious of them. So I'm going to take that view, at least, and think about state space again, going back to state space, and just think of it in a sort of simple two-dimensional cut, where you have A is the thing I'm being conscious of. Let's think of it as the clock, if you like and uh, along the x-axis is the rest of the universe. So we're talking about variations in the state of the rest of the universe. Um, and in some sense, that thick black line represents a phase space trajectory that we are kind of moving on in time. If you like, you could think of it as the classical uh, trajectory where you solve the Euler-Lagrange equations for, you know, some classical representation of the world. Um, but if quantum physics has some role in cognition, then my view is that we must therefore, and if it's expressed through this state space geometry, it must mean that we have some um, awareness of these neighboring trajectories on, on the invariant set. I've tried to describe that a little bit mathematically. Um, so we have this notion of a clock A and our perception of the clock. And in a classical sense, we can think of the clock as sort of just evolving, you know, it ticks along on the central trajectory. So we're kind of integrating over phase space, but we're applying a delta function, which all it does is, is single out that one single classical trajectory. And that's, what, uh, that's kind of what classical physics does. But maybe what's happening in quantum physics, if this idea is right, is that uh, that delta function gets replaced by some kind of finite kernel, which just feels a little bit of the neighboring uh, geometry. Um, formally, if this is a fractal set, it's some kind of Ha measure, if you, if you want to be kind of precise about it. Um, so that's kind of a, and it, you know, it's, it's a little bit like, you know, if you drive from A to B along the road, and all you're doing is looking at your sat-nav, you know, you've got no idea where you're going, you've got no idea, you know, if you drive from Oxford to London, you, you, just, you just follow your sat-nav, you've got no idea which direction you're going, you don't know when you're in the countryside, when you're in the town, you just follow the sat-nav. And so you don't have a very, you don't, you know, you don't have a very good experience, I would say. On the other hand, if you can look around and sort of drive by, you know, following your, your senses, then you, you get a much broader experience. You see you're leaving, you're going in a certain direction, you're leaving the town, you're in the countryside, there are the cows, there's the, you know, the, the river and so on and so forth, and then you enter the city. So, it's a kind of a richer experience if you look around you. And I kind of feel that that's a, an analogy for what may be happening here. Um, and linked to that is the feeling of free, free will. I, I mean, I, I don't know, I, I don't want to get into what is free will and what isn't free will. But a question which fascinates me, and I, I don't feel we discuss enough, is why do we actually have such a visceral feeling of free will? We all have that feeling, whether we whether it's intellectually, you know, we don't like the idea, or, or we do like the idea, I don't know, but we all, at some sort of very deep visceral level, we feel that. 
And again, I, you know, that may be a consequence, again, of, you know, replacing A by myself now, me, myself, I, having some con cognition of neighbouring states in that direction where I am varying. And I, that gives me this perception of counterfactual, I could have done otherwise types of worlds. Now, I'm not stating this just in some platonic way. I'm just saying these are actually real physical worlds which impinge on our, our own existence. And um, I, 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 when I was going through this talk last night, I almost uh, rejected this slide, but we had a discussion. We've had some talks about um, Vigna's friend um, and uh, Bell's theorem this morning. And, um, you know, um, we have, a, you know, I mean, there's undoubtedly the case we have a hard time understanding what quantum no-go theorems are telling us about the world. And um, I don't know if Will is in the audience or not. Oh, you are, yeah. Um, because Will, Will gave a nice talk this morning about the, the Wigner's friend paradox. And, you know, he, Will clearly stated, um, you know, assumptions you have to, you have to give up on if you're, if you're going to uh, understand what's going on. And one of them involves the notion of, of interventions. And I'm not quite sure where the word originated, but people who are familiar with uh, Judea Pearl's causal inference modeling will be familiar with this notion of an intervention. It's essentially a kind of counterfactual perturbation that you make to a state of the world to kind of look to see what would have happened if something had been different. You know, I threw the stone uh, and it broke the window, but do I know I causally threw, you know, the, I caused the window to break? Well, you apply an intervention which says the world is, is as it was, but I didn't throw the stone. And then you, you look to see, you know, from your equations or whatever, would the window have broken under that situation? Um, so these interventions, are, uh, they are fundamental in, in modern kind of causal theory. But they're not things in a way that happen in the real world. They're things that, that you postulate are consequences of your theoretical uh, understanding of the world. And typically these are made, I would say, without any scrutiny or, or, or um, really without any consideration at all. It's kind of assumed that you can always do this. And indeed, in classical, you know, in most classical physics, if you have a differential equation which is governing your evolution, uh, from an initial state, you can always, well, almost always, you can change the initial condition in some way and then apply your differential equation to see what would happen. Um, uh, and in some sense, this intuitive idea that interventions are kind of reasonable things uh, are consistent with this visceral belief in free will. However, um, this is where this idea of non-computability comes in, because the non-computability um, is a, or a manifestation of this non-computability is this gappiness in the structure of this of these fractal sets on all scales, you know, from very from larger to small scales, and in in a sense, one of the Simon Dubé's uh, non-undecidable problems is is to know whether a line you know, a given line actually lies on the invariant set or on the, on the fractal or in a gap. Um, so the, the invariant set is, are these, are these non-computable sets are typically gappy. So then you have a question. If there's your intervention, if you think of your intervention as a counterfactual perturbation, which in this case, like we're talking about Bell's theorem, it would be changing Alice's measurement setting, keeping Bob's measurement setting and all the particle hidden variables fixed. If that takes you into one of these gaps, then suddenly you're no longer got an inter you've no longer got an intervention which is consistent with your laws of physics. So in other words, what I'm trying to say is this, this, this for me is a, a, a plausible, I'm not, claiming it's definitely the solution, but it's a plausible solution of, to a lot of these no-go problems. Uh, it's not to do with non-locality or indeterminism or unreality or something like that. It's to do with the fact that interventions 
cannot be assumed a priori. There are limitations. Now, the problem is our brains, if we have some perception of this, if you like, these kind of transversal directions in phase space, um, our brains are not kind of quantum enough to really um, perceive at least these gaps. We just have this vague, sort of slightly blurry perception of this geometry off the central trajectory. So it's kind of difficult, I think, uh, and this is where I get into a lot of, you know, debates, and I have, I have to confess it's incredibly frustrating to, for, to try to persuade my colleagues in this area that we shouldn't think of interventions as a given, you know, despite the fact it's very useful in certainly in classical causal theory. So our faulty intuition about interventions might, in my view, leads us to an uncritical acceptance of them, and, and as a result, we wrongly interpret Bell's inequality or Wigner's friend as evidence of either non-locality or maybe the non-objective nature of observed events, which, which I think is a much more crazy um, idea. Um, I, I, we, we had a discussion this morning, and the usual argument against because if you, if you violate, well, if you, if you claim not all interventions are permissible, then you're effectively violating what's called the measurement independence postulate in Bell's theorem. And if you do that, uh, then you're cast as a super determinist, uh, which I think is a word that Bell himself used. And then people will immediately throw at you all these arguments about conspiracy and, uh, you know, drug trials that have been manipulated and all that sort of stuff. And I wrote this paper, which actually only went on the archive a few days ago, uh, which I'm getting a lot of heated uh, emails about, um, which is that whilst if you, if you invent a conspiratorial theory, which has, you know, weird correlations and things, then for sure it will violate the measurement independence postulate, but the converse, I claim, is not true, uh, that violation of measurement independence implies conspiracy. So that's, that's what I'm trying to do in that paper. Um, yeah, just, well, uh, maybe going slightly off topic, but um, I think one of the beautiful aspects about these fractal attractors and so on uh, which opens up a lot of interesting uh, kind of multidisciplinary thought, is that they are very holistic structures in um, in state space. So, so you can't you, you know you can't just sort of analyze your differential equations in a neighborhood of state space to determine whether or not a given point lies on a on a uh, on a fractal set or not. Um, so these sets are in some sense very holistic. They they bind together. Uh, the properties of the differential equations over literally an infinite time. And if this set is, if this idea is relevant to the universe or to physics, if you like, um, there are some implications about this because it does mean that, uh, I mean, Roger talked about, you know, our search for quantum gravity. And, and I think most people, and he talked about, you know, singularities and so on, and, and, that, and that's what most people think of it as this kind of a race down to the Planck scale, that we find equations which somehow describe the Planck scale, and then everything, you know, will emerge from that, and it'll all be hunky-dory and we'll explain everything. We can kind of go home and put our feet up and do something different. But um, uh, this actually uh, would suggest something very different, which is that... Um, the, if this is right, the laws of physics would, the fundamental laws of physics, in other words, this, this geometry, would be as much about the large scale, or, or describe as much, would, would describe the large scale structure of the universe as much as the small scale. So in some sense, there'd be a kind of synergy between the, the cosmological scales and the Planck scales. And I, I like to kind of think that, um, you know, I mean, in science, we tend to think very kind of re reductionistly about, as I say, Planck scale driving the large scale. You know, if you talk to artists and, you know, musicians, painters, writers, I mean, they hate this idea. They, when they look at a work of art, they look at the whole thing. You know, they say you can't understand it without looking at the whole thing. I mean, a great example is Escher's hands drawing hands. You know, if you zoomed into into the hands drawing hands, you'd, you'd probably get an idea about the technical skill of Escher in drawing things, but you'd have no understanding of the actual 
picture itself. So I like to think that, that this is a, a kind of a picture of the world which sort of combines both our traditional scientific and much more, if you like, holistic artistic thinking of the world. Um, so I guess I am in agreement with, with Roger then that uh, if we do, or I mean, maybe we don't want to do this, but if AI really does want to start um, somehow emulating human um, consciousness and intelligence and so on, we're going to have to start thinking about synthesizing classical and quantum technology together. Um, I, I'm inclined to agree with him about that. But as a kind of start, I feel... Uh, this is, again, a slightly tangential remark, but I do feel um, there is more, perhaps, that could be done in the classical domain by embracing stochasticity in AI more than it is. I mean, I'm not, I do understand that, you know, stochastic, stochasticity is used. But I think the brain is a fundamentally very um, noisy, uh, it's a low, you know, very low power system, and... It, it, there's no question that it has a lot of noise in it. And I, I think the brain actually makes use of that noise in a, in a constructive way. And we see that in the way people get ideas. You know, people tend to... I mean, Roger famously wrote about his Nobel Prize-winning idea, crossing the road, dodging the buses and the traffic. And it was only later he realised, when he applied some analytical thinking, that, oh, yeah, that really was a good idea. And... Um, I don't think we make enough of that idea in current AI of sort of just more or less, you know, getting ideas in a quasi-random way and then using our using more deterministic thinking to either promote some ideas and bash down other ideas. Um, and it kind of reminds... The whole thing reminds me a little bit about, if, if people know about the simulated annealing heuristic algorithm uh, for finding the maximum of, of a sort of complicated objective function, uh, using stochastics. That's a very good example of, you know... It, it, the stochastic scheme just gives you trial places to look at uh, on, on, a, on an objective function. And you have criteria for determining whether you accept or reject that, um, that guess. And the criteria initially are quite lax, and they actually, there's a good chance you'll accept a place that actually is lower than you currently are. But as you get closer and closer to the final solution, then you get more discerning. And I think that's pretty much the way human, human sort of creativity works too. Um, so that, that's, I think, some... You know, you could think of noise as kind of poor man's quantum in some sense. So that, I think, would be a start. Um, if I'm allowed to finish with a, somewhat of an advert, I've written about all this stuff in a rather qualitative way in this book, uh, and um, I'm happy to uh, take emails about it if you want to take a look. Thank you.